Welcome to One Work, Five Questions with Donna Vitek and Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek. Thank you for joining us today. And And Jefferson, Jefferson. the real Jefferson. Yeah, he's starting on my lap to start the video today. He knew you were coming, (laughs) something's up. How you doing? Good, good. Uh, Excited to see Jefferson. (laughs) <laughs> I get to see him every show. The cute Jefferson. I, I uh, well, I see him way too often. He hangs oh. around me all the time. That's all right. He's my buddy. Yes, he's a cutie pie. He he makes the show. He makes it all worth it. <laughs> and I see we have the black adder font. Uh, yes, I really. You said you liked it, so I thought I'd change. I the, like um, it because I love the black adder. You know, watch the old um, black adder videos. Oh. Very, very funny. Rowan Atkinson, by the way, very funny stuff. Oh, okay. I'll have to I'll have to check it out. Well, today's uh, letter, I'm excited about this. I think more excited than you are to talk about. Well, you picked um, this one out. I, I wasn't quite sure why you wanted it because it was so short, but there's stuff, there's stuff there. I, yeah, I like well, I, I liked it for several reasons. Um, Thomas Jefferson to John Harvey. Number one, I want to know who John Harvey is. Um, and, and it was written on my birthday, um, except I wasn't born in 1760. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I look like it though, right? Um, so yes, know. it is. It is a short letter. I it, I don't know if it's his shortest letter, but um, um, I really liked it because it it just showed me that even back when he was sixteen, he was still very analytical about everything, um, and and that's something that never changed over his lifetime, um, or at least between sixteen and and when he was writing the head and heart letter. So. Um, so there were a couple reasons why I, why I picked this. Um, and uh, I, I liked it also because he was only 16 when he wrote it. Um, so that's a that's a big deal. Imagine if we had his lost letters that got burnt in the fire. Wow. We, you know, we'd get more of an idea of what was going on. That's why it's so hard to write of his early life because we don't know much. We have to sort of piece it together from fragments that we find in his writings about his early life like his autobiography and so forth he doesn't talk much about his early life though yeah so um well before we get started though i do have to i cannot overlook this credentials 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 um and what makes you the a a thomas jefferson scholar and um dr holacek has written over uh 23 let's just say numerous published books um, on Thomas Jefferson and close to 155 essays on Thomas Jefferson, which can be found in the video description. Um, Dr. Holacek is a PhD retired professor of philosophy and history. And to me, I the prefer best- to say just just professor, because there's something about when I think about it, uh, about being a professor is like being what president of the United States or something. I'm not comparing the two, but once you're president, I guess you're just president, even when you retire. That's the, I think the same way with a professor. You're a professor. That's right. And you'll always be, and you've been my greatest. Yeah, you're always going to be. <laughs> and, and I'm not retired for gosh sakes. I'm more productive now than I've ever been. So, right. Anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. That's true. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess retired from dealing with students, except for me, I think I've been your high maintenance student. <laughs> That's all right. We uh, we uh, uh, teach each other. We learn from each other that way. <laughs> Tell you um, what, and I'll, uh, one comment in doing this show, it makes me go back to letters that sometimes the letters you pick out and read them much more carefully than I read them before. So it's always a good thing. Oh, yeah. I learn. I really do. That, and, and I've learned a lot, too, just in reading his letters now for a year. I can remember the first episode we ever did. It I had to read the letter... Uh, I think it was his inaugural address, and I had to read it multiple times. I had to watch a video um, of somebody reading it, and uh, it was tough. And now I'm starting to understand um, the way Thomas Jefferson thinks, and it's yeah. making it easier to understand. It, his it comes together in time. It it sure does, and and it's been fun. It's we've been doing this for um, a year now, right? It's been over a year. Yeah, this is thirty-seven. Yeah. All so right, let's our, move on to the letter here. Yes. So we well, time. with our show, One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. And today we have the first letter on record that um, that we have. Um, and it's written to John Harvey on January 14th, 1760. Um, 
There were other letters, but they were lost in a fire at his Shadwell residence. Um, on, uh, let's see, uh, oh, that was in February of 1770, written when he was, this letter was written when he was only 16 years old. How many of you were writing letters like this at 16 years old? Think about that. Um, going away to college was suggested by a relative and young Thomas was undecided about what to do. In a short letter, but I suspect Dr. Holojack will show us that there is here plenty to unpack. Um, so I can't wait. I can't wait to have my questions answered. Um, I'm, I'm Donna Vitek, and this is One Work, Five Questions. Okay, are you ready for number one? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay, Let's question number one. Who were John Harvey and Colonel Peter Randolph? Well, when his father died not too long ago, um, you know, John Harvey wound up being the executor of his estate, and Jefferson had to wait a certain time till he had reached a certain age before he could manage affairs, and the affairs were in the hands of his mother till then, and so maybe that caused some tension. And Colonel, Colonel P Peter Randolph um, was a cousin of Jefferson's mother, Jane Randolph, and, oh. and that's enough to, to, to get us there. Now, at the time, some background information, Thomas, as a young boy, was being tutored by Reverend James Morey, whom Jefferson called uh, a correct and classical scholar, a correct classical scholar. And I suspect, you know, unpacking that, he means he doesn't necessarily, I mean, he talked about how he loved learning the classics in the Greek and Latin languages, which he always loved to read. And he uh, uh, said he owed much to Reverend Morey, and he had a great library from which Jefferson could draw in, you know, um, uh, and so he was uh, excited about that. Um, anyways, um, you know, and there were, I should say, there were uh, Dabney Carr, who was his best friend, who, who died while young, John Page, who was a young friend, lifelong friend, John Walker, a neighbor, Reverend James Madison, not the James Madison was president, Reverend James Madison was his older cousin, all went to school there with Thomas Jefferson. So these were some very, very important people in Virginia's history. Oh, wow. So I wonder how much of an influence that was on him. Hmm. Okay, question number two. Thomas Jefferson mentions several reasons um, for matriculation. What are they? Okay, we got to go to his letter. Maybe you, you have okay. a copy of the letter. Yeah, I'll I'll share it. Put that up, and we can just I can just read from okay. the screen. Um, we go about halfway down. Uh, well, no, Mark, uh, on the left side he says, "In the first place, uh -huh. as long as I stay at the mountain, the loss of one fourth my time is inevitable." My company's coming here and detaining me from school, so. You know, shows you how much of a student he wants to be uh, is that he's considering, you know, everything is efficiency for him. And by the yeah. way, we can get rid of the junior Thomas Jefferson's father was Peter, even though his father's father was Thomas and there was another Thomas before that. Anyway, um, he'd be Thomas Jefferson the third, perhaps. Wow. Uh, so so he's, he's, wait, he's worried about time wasted, right? I, you know, instead of all, instead of having fun, the time where people come and visit, talk, to chat, I could be using that to study, which is, you know, how many kids today would say the same thing, wasting a fourth of my, but that's how Jefferson was. He was rather strange. He says, and likewise, my absence will in great measure put a stop to so much company. And by that means lessen the expenses of the estate and housekeeping. One less person, one less mouth to feed, the argument is, okay. Um on the other hand, by going to the college, I shall get a more universal acquaintance, which may hereafter be serviceable to me. Um, what does he mean by universal acquaintance? Um, difficult to, to, to figure that out. Universal acquaintance with what? Uh, is he talking about, I will broaden my education by universal acquaintance? So we, we're not told universal acquaintance with what? So I'm just going to leave that which may hereafter, I, I, I'm going to, my suggestion is, and I don't know this, is that he's talking about, I'll get a broader education than I can get right. here. That's a suggestion. 
And he says, the fourth reason, I suppose I can pursue my studies in the Greek and Latin as well there as here, and likewise learn something of the mathematics. So this is not a reason per se, because it seems like he's learning his Greek and Latin very well at home. He's not bothered in that respect. Um, but his mathematics perhaps is suffering. Uh, so maybe it's best to be tutored in mathematics at the college. So he's asking for his opinion. Um, he's a young man here, so he's asking of, uh, of uh, John Harvey, you know, the executor of his father's will, his opinion whether he should go to the college. And Jefferson is saying, please say yes, please say yes, please, he wants to go to college. How many people think that way? It's like, oh, I got to go to college. Not at 16, not today. No, that's not, that's pretty well, not at 16. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for gosh sakes, in my last few years of teaching philosophy, I mean, students wouldn't even buy books. They just said, we don't need to buy books. And, you know, and no one at these colleges would pressure them to buy the books. They didn't want to buy the books, so what? How are you going to learn if you can do the reading? Right, the textbooks are... I, I wish I had a classroom of Thomas Jefferson's all the time. They would really push you as a teacher. I would love that. I'd love to be pushed by students. Yeah, yeah. That he, he would have... Oh, that would have been a nice student to have. Um, okay, question number three. What was the option other than college for Jefferson? He mentions the loss of one-fourth of my time. Is he making the case for going away to college as opposed to studying at home? Well, you ask a few questions there. The loss of one fourth of my time, we talked about that, relates to the intrusion of people visiting, chit chatting, and, and maybe singing, dancing, having fun. It's sort of like, hey, you know, I'm 16, I want to learn, I want to get my learn on. So, um, what was the other first question you asked? Um, what was the other, what was the option other than college for Jefferson? Now, for a, a genteel, uh, young Virginian, there weren't too many options. That was the problem. And it really was a serious problem. Uh, uh, if you, you couldn't do other things because he comes from a, his father was relatively wealthy, a self-made man, and he is considered to be, uh, in some measure, I use this word hesitantly because Jefferson hated the word, an aristocrat. Mm -hmm. But his father was an aristocrat by bootstrap, pulling himself up from his own bootstraps by make, being a self-made person. And Jefferson is born into money, as it were. Uh, there weren't too many options. Like he was great at fiddling, but when he went to dances and and when he met with the governor Fauquier and, and played fiddled in his quote unquote little band, um, he would never accept money for that because you couldn't. You're you're sort of like part of the upper class and right. you had to behave like a member of the upper class you couldn't you know you couldn't he couldn't become a professional musician because that's what someone who of the lower classes would do except money for for doing things like that so the options would be stay there and oversee his farm be a plantation owner uh, and i think he found that dreary drearily disgusting let's put it that way go ahead and become a lawyer, which he did do. And he retired from law. And I think he found law at some point disgusting and boring because you know, he didn't have the loud booming voice, didn't have a great present, presence in front of a crowd. And he saw from his first inaugural address, his address was barely heard by people. And the other problem with law is that it wasn't honest. Little has changed these days, right? It just wasn't honest. And people would, you know, people were, lawyers were getting money for winning cases when, you know, they were defending people who were guilty. Right. And, and Jefferson experienced that. I think he was just fed up with that. That, okay, people like quote, Patrick Henry, for example, could be a very successful lawyer without knowing a lot about different things by just having a great presence in front of, say, the camera, as mm -hmm. it were. Uh, no cameras back then, but you understand what I'm saying. So the other option would be is politics. And so to engage in law politics, one had to have uh, an education, a suitable education. Uh, the, the education in law was mostly through tutorial. They didn't really have, law really wasn't so much being taught uh, at the time. So Jefferson 
had to study under the lawyer George With, whom he met at the college of William and Mary. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, and I'm sure I I'm glad he got into politics. <laughs> got into a little of that. I know you love that. So, well, where would we be today if there were no Jefferson? Yeah. <laughs> a world I mean, without we, Jefferson. We, we need him back. I, I yeah. Think so. Yeah, who knows where we would be? It was like he's erased. Um, well, according to the people that write on Jefferson today, he's responsible for everything that's wrong with our country today. It's racism, it's hypocrisy, it's uh, it's uh, dualism with respect to the partisan bickering. Uh, you know that that's the notion of doing history from above. Uh, when you take certain concepts, as I said in one of my other videos, you take certain concepts and those concepts have to go into any explanation of past figures like uh, hypocrisy, uh, racism, and things like that. We have to use that to explain all the founding powers, right? And that's oh. not how you do history. Enough of that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Question number four. Does Jefferson end up going to college? And if so, what college does he choose and why? I can answer that quickly. Uh, you probably know this here answering it, just asking it for, he goes well, to William and Mary. Uh, yes, I know. He goes to William and Mary and studies there for two years. And, okay. uh, from 1760 to 1762, quick course of study. That's that. So he has equivalent to today would be an associate's degree. I didn't think in terms of degrees at, at that time. It just oh. didn't have a course of study. If oh, okay. So about, he just did classes and, and you just took Whatever class yeah, it you, take. you know, and uh, things were quite a bit different back then. You know, you didn't go there to be a mathematics professor or this or that. You just you just went to the college and took what they offered you. In fact, by the time Jefferson opens UVA, this is the first time in the country you have elective education. You can select the sort of courses you wanted to. That was novel. No one, no college did that. Uh, university or college did that at the time. Uh, Jefferson insistent that uh, everybody be educated to his own interests, likes, and needs. Mm. If I'm going to be a farmer and I want to go to the college, uh, what do I need? I, you know, I don't need a college education per se, but, um, but it, you know, say I wanted to get, go to a college for whatever, you know, so I can be a better manager of my own estate. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to be able to take certain courses, right? Uh, I, I don't need high level mathematics. Right. Okay. So, um, so um, do you know um, why he chose William and Mary? There was no other choice. <laughs> so, oh! The only college in the area. Oh, okay. Second, second oldest college in the United States. There was nothing else oh. in Virginia. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, so that was okay. the school. What? You got your master's where? Grand Canyon University online. There was, there was no Grand Canyon that he to which he could go, and he couldn't do it online. Why not? I don't, <laughs> I don't think the internet was around back then. Was it? <laughs> yeah. No internet. Yeah. So no internet. <laughs> I think he would have detested, flipping detested online education because of yeah. its lack of intimacy. Let me, let me say something briefly here. When he went to university to William and Mary, right, and I mentioned this before, he didn't hang around with fellow students, drinking, gaming, and you know, playing cards and whatever. He hung around with his teacher, Dr. Um, uh, Small, right, who was a professor of philosophy and mathematics. He hung around with, the, the, that professor introduced him to George Wythe, who was the foremost uh, lawyer in Virginia and a very liberal leaning person. And he was also introduced to Governor Fauquier. Wow. You know, he talked in his autobiography, talks of it being a parti quare. There were a foursome. The four of them were inseparable. So here's a guy who, at a young age, right, 1760, he was born, what, 1743? So he's 16, 17, going to William and Mary, hanging out with the governor, with the, the foremost lawyer in the state, and with one of the professors. 
how many kids at that age would be interested in hanging out? This is how right. much this guy wanted to learn. That's why, like you mentioned, it's an important letter. He's wasting. So, you know, part of the problem with the University of Virginia and his bills for education, Jefferson, in a very weird sense, presupposed that all other, in a very unconscious sense or subconscious sense, presupposed that everybody had at least a sort of drive to learn that he did. Oh. And he just did it. I, I mean, look, he's talking about wasting a quarter of my time. All that yeah. time I could waste. I used to think the same way when I went back to school after working seven years in a factory. I went back to school and I got up at five in the morning so I could read novels, so I could be up on the great literature of the day and poetry. And I I loved it when I went back to school. I, I was in love with it. I just, I would, the first time I taught after I graduated with my PhD, I remember I was at Eastern Michigan and I'd hang out at the library and I'd stay there all day and come home late at night. And I'm thinking, this is like being in heaven. It's like, a, it's like an oasis in the desert when you leave that intellectual climate, it's like you're going into the real world, and I hated it. Yeah, I no longer think that, that way, but uh, <laughs> you, need to, you need to go out, as Plato says. You need to leave the cave. And go oh, and now you're slumming it with me every week. We're doing. Uh... <laughs> well, this this is a little bit of the. I'm not slumming it per se. It's a little <laughs> bit of that oasis that I get. Uh, like I said that this series really does force me to go back and carefully dissect like this he gives right you, you break this letter up you see four arguments one of which i don't get when he talks about more universal acquaintance which may hereafter be serviceable to me what's the universal acquaintance i don't know what that means hmm. i suspect no one does because he doesn't say acquaintance with x what's the x right i suspect like i said you know so i mean you have to read that carefully uh, Today's historians, right, the, the neo-progressivists, uh, we don't have to dissect and analyze anything. You can just read into it. You can say more universal acquaintance. That that the direct reference to, to sex with Sally Hemings. Yeah, and and, and then uh, claim it as if it's fact. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You just, you know, can't take Jefferson at his word. I do that all the time. I take, take everyone at his word, her word, unless... Right. You need to give a reason why you shouldn't. Right. People right. are not, no one really is an incorrigible liar. No one is. Mm -hmm. very, or very few people. And if they are, you just, they don't have any friends. If you're lying all the time, you, every utterance you make, you know, everybody goes to the wall. That's, that, that's probably false. Right. You couldn't right. live if you were an incorrigible liar. You couldn't even make business transactions. Anyways, I'm mean, not about that. <laughs> so that, it shows um, just how mature. Jefferson Thomas Jefferson was even at a young age how mature he was to want to hang out with the governor or, or nutty I mean you, you know it it, sh it shows his um, a, a little of a psychological imbalance that all great people have right that this this wanting to suck up knowledge so much there's a letter uh, to Bernard Moore uh, he writes Bernard Moore writes him but of course a study for a lawyer that we should do sometime. And Jefferson gives him this from a letter he wrote years ago, gives him this enormously large list of things that a lawyer needs to know. And he not only tells them what he needs to know, he tells them the manner in which the books need to be read. Which books? Read this book, but read this one first, this next, this next. Don't study, you know, and, and then you should study um, history at a certain time. You can do that on your own. When should you study? The, the early morning hours are most important for the study that the law and politics and the media issues. And as you go throughout the day, you 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 read and study less media issues. So the mind, because the mind's tired. And you, mm -hmm. So it's like, literally, you look at this in that every single day, you're talking about 16 hours of study. Mm -hmm. With a break, perhaps, for a little walk. Who the hell's going to do that and survive? Well, Thomas Jefferson, uh, and he, and because uh, he said a fourth, so well, <laughs> his sixteen yeah, hours. Let's go back to Jefferson as a lawyer. It it shows you. I I suggested he got tired of the law. Jefferson thought Jefferson for a lawyer had to be knowledgeable about everything of any practical benefit for humans. 
which meant that you had to study stuff Patrick Henry never studied. Jefferson called Henry the laziest person in reading I've ever known. He gave them a couple volumes of, of David Hume's works. And then he brings them back in some period of time. And Jefferson asked, what did you get? He goes, oh, I couldn't get through this stuff. It's just you know, not interested, boring, wow. Uh, but, but Henry was a highly successful lawyer because he gesticulated and he had a large booming voice and a presence that Jefferson didn't have, but he didn't have the knowledge. And Jefferson, I suspect, hated law at some point because here I am arguing logically and basing my my uh, arguments upon, you know, good premises, truthful premises, and yet I'm losing cases. Right. Uh, how silly is that? Uh, that that's what goes on in history today. Is that uh -huh. you know no one cares about sound arguments. I was telling a friend of mine uh, earlier in the day by email that. You know, when you go to Poplar Forest or Monticello, you get stories and the people who are telling these stories don't vet their information. They, you know, they get it from a particular source and this is just the way it is. And we're, we're not going to investigate or in, in, analyze this. It's hell with the logic. We don't care about it. We're just going to tell a story and feed it to you. Oh, that's so scary to see what's going to happen over the next decade um, with our history. Um, are you ready for question number five? I, I guess so. Okay. What was Thomas Jefferson's course of study? I was so interested to know what he chose to study. Well, remember I told you there was no choosing. Right. And he introduced a bill when he revised the bills. And one of the bills was to change the course of study at William Mary. Get rid of, here's what we have. We know from his notes on uh, notes on Virginia, notes on the state of Virginia, query 15, he talks about William and Mary. I told you William and Mary was the only thing on the plate. Mm -hmm. Didn't have a choice. He had to go, in what was William and Mary? And Anglican, Anglicanism was the religion uh, practiced by most people in England, the state, state sanction. William and Mary was an Anglican institution, and they were, for the most part, churning out, designed to churn out Anglican ministers. Oh. And Jefferson was not going to go that route, obviously. So at the time, he mentions there are six professors, 20 visitors. Visitors would be sort of like overseers, you know, making sure everything runs. You know, and uh, if you read accounts of the early history of it, as I have, there was uh, drunkenness going on with professors, by the way, <laughs> drinking on the job or whatever. Uh, one professor for Greek and Latin. And Jefferson objects that since Greek and Latin was part of the learning of the day for anyone who wanted to be a learned Virginian, children would fill the college. So they'd get in the way, right? You have a lot of young, young boys coming there to learn Greek and Latin. So that got in the way of serious study of Greek and Latin. Another professorship of, so we had Greek and Latin, mathematics, which makes sense. Moral philosophy, and I'm sure the moral philosophy at the time was just Anglican religion. Then you had a professor of divinity, another professor of divinity, and then you had the college, we call it a school of Brafferton. Now, what was Brafferton? This was something done by uh, a certain Mr. Boyle, named after Brafferton was one of his estates, presumably. And this was for educating Native Americans in the Christian religion. Ah. So you'd seek out Native Americans to come to the school. And uh, it, so basically out of the six professorships, three are involved in four really, because moral philosophy is more likely going to be Christianity. So you have four, you're getting religious education. Uh -huh. it, it, you know, and we know Jefferson, of course, um, like I said, he would hang out with his professor of mathematics and mm -hmm. philosophy, Dr. Uh, Small, and, you know, George Wythe, the lawyer, the great lawyer, and the governor, you know, mm -hmm. so you could see why. So what did Jefferson study there? Um, I suspect, you know, he took the classes he had to take. He doesn't say anything about, you know, this religious education there. And I think, you know, you had to get up and prayers and mass and whatever. 
Um, so this is a very strict regiment, and I'm sure he hated that. And I suspect you find Jefferson, you know, with his professor Small uh, recommending books to him, and he going off on his own. And, and he was a self-starter. Uh -huh. For example, when he got done with this, and he studied for two years under George With to be a lawyer. Uh -huh. uh, oftentimes, what would happen? I'm giving listeners a little more than they're asking for here. Oftentimes, what would happen is the lawyer would, in exchange for this sort of tutorial practice, a hands on practice in law, you know, Jefferson would do all the dirty work. Yeah. I need you to get this from me. I need you to do that. I need you to look this up. You know, With didn't do any of that with Jefferson. And, and, and you know, we do know that. Uh, With thought so much of Thomas Jefferson's budding intellect that. Um, and, and Jefferson himself says, look, you know, if you really want to be a lawyer, he tells it in that letter to Bernard Moore, as I mentioned, he says, all you have to do is you need books, read, yeah. read, study the law. So that was that. I mean, it, it's a good letter you picked up because it shows you at a very young age, you said he's 16 at the time, that it shows you what a self-starter he is. It shows you how Henry Winsack points out that Jefferson had this moment where, and he points out to one passage where Jefferson talks about how you can, you know, economize on the labor of slaves. That if a slave does this and this and this, does that the right way, and he's mathematics and everything, I can make such money. Yeah, did Jefferson say that? Yeah. Does that prove Jefferson wanted to monetize over slavery? Jefferson arithmetized everything, as you see here. One quarter of my time is wasted. He's probably literally counting the hours. I would not be surprised to see this, this guy, this neurotic, and he was neurotic, I probably am too, to see this neurotic sitting down and saying, okay, writing down company enters at such and such time. Company <laughs> leaves at such and such time. I can see it too. Uh -huh. I, I missed five hours of study time. I go to bed, I sit around, boring, yawning at the dull conversation, talking about nothing. And so he's probably writing down. Um, I, I, I see that, that's Jefferson. The fact yeah. that you're seeing that too means you're starting to understand who Thomas Jefferson was. Yeah. 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 And, and you do. And that's why that's another reason I picked the letter, because he was so young and it's yeah. such a reflection, even as he grew into adulthood, some things about him. just. And, and look, the, you know, we something. talk about the neurosis of this guy. This is not the sort of all the arguments for an affair with Sally Hemings aside. Yeah. It's his neurosis just it makes it to me inconceivable that he could carry on a relationship on the side with anyone. Right, right, right. Because anyone is, they're going to make demands on your time. Right, right. In an affair. And Jefferson was too regulated for that. He would have grown weary of that. Right. I, you know, you can say, well, anybody's libido can force them. Uh, no. No. I, he, he would have objected to, well, I'm, you know, I'm with this person so and so, and I, you know, you know, he violates that a bit when he's with Maria Cosway in France. But uh, as a minister plenipotentiary in France, he had a lot of free time. Yeah, a lot of free time. Well, yeah. also there were even inconsistencies in in his devotion of time with her, as much as he loved her. If you look at the at the, uh, you know, it, it, the he was writing more than he was equal than it was he was less you know he even there was no consistency with that either over time yeah, and, and with so. the difference was with Cosway when they spent time together they were learning episodes they really mm -hmm. were they were going to art museums they're going listening to musical concerts they were doing all sorts of educatively rich things together she was a world famous a world class artist she was adept in music so he was, in some sense, honing his his appreciation, his aesthetic sense, and his appreciation for the fine arts. They were learning experiences together. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot imagine. It's completely fucking inconceivable to me to think that Jefferson could be want to be with someone who is uneducated. Uh, she might be pretty, but he just could not. He, inconceivable he could be with someone just for lustful reasons only. Yeah. Just like it, he, he'd be wasting, he'd be writing down, I'm wasting time. 
<laughs> right, right. Yeah, this right. exactly. Well, um, we're we're getting close to running out of time. And before we go, though, I think this is very important. Um, the scholars, Thomas Jefferson, Vital Writings of a Vital American. Can you tell us a little bit about the contents of this book? And um, this is written yeah, by Dr. Holland. This Hollandeck. was my you know, Mel Peterson put together a book from which I draw all the time. Uh, it's called Jefferson Writings, and it's uh -huh. a wonderful collection. I considered it to be, he's got the letter from Harvey. My book doesn't have the letter for Harvey because it's just not that significant a letter. Um, I always wanted to come up with, you know, so this is a compilation of the, the most significant writings of Thomas Jefferson. And I wanted to come up with my own book. Peterson was the great Thomas Jefferson scholar, uh, much, I think, superior to Dumas Malone. And, you know, Peter Onuf was the third Thomas Jefferson scholar, and, and uh, I don't have a high opinion. I just don't think he did anything uh, to help us understand Thomas Jefferson other than call him a racist and a hypocrite. Uh, uh. He did nothing. This is a, Peterson's compilation is fantastic. What, what my book differs in effect because I break Jefferson's, I'm a philosopher principally. And uh, I'm interested, when I do history, I do what I like to call analytic history. So I have a book on Jefferson's political philosophy, one on his philosophy of education, one on his moral sense. So I started in this book with, um, I don't know if you can see, but I have the, uh, you know, I talk about politics and political philosophy. So I have a whole collection of his most vital writings on politics. I go to morality and religion and morality and religion were equivalent. Natural religion was morality. Then I look in the theory and practice, praxis of education. And then the fourth part, I have what I call collectania, just other things you need to know that are philosophical relevance to Thomas Jefferson. Okay. So I break things apart um, in terms of having certain, you know, writings of Jefferson that are significant, but they're readily accessible for someone who wants to look at Jefferson's theory of religion and morality right on that so you don't you've already to... you've already grouped the the letters that pertain to these specific categories together in your book so yes that... i have okay that would make it easy for people doing research and how can they get this book well you have to go through uh, amazon i guess i, I have okay. only one copy but i love that picture that is a john trumbull picture that's the picture <laughs> i have in my office the miniature of thomas jefferson yeah, yeah, maybe, that is a, it's a nice maybe picture. Maybe the one that Maria Cosway had hanging in her house. Never mind. <laughs> exactly. Oh, so I, I'd like for you to give a little teaser on next week's episode um, that we're doing. What? Okay, this was my choice. We're doing a letter to Dr. Benjamin Waterhouse. Um, you have the dates June 26, 1822. Jefferson gives expression to his Unitarianism. The okay. Unitarianism was considered to be a sectarian religion, one of different types of religion. Uh, I will explain why that's problematic. The Jefferson always expressed a sort of execration, at least I assert, uh -huh. against sectarian religions because they all have in mind one thing, love of God and love of fellow human beings, but then there are all sorts of metaphysical trappings like there are angels and devils and, you know, three gods and, you know, so... He detested Trinitarianism, this three gods in one, and he always professed to be a Unitarianism. So mm -hmm. how do we reconcile his Unitarianism with uh, his anti-sectarianism? That's what we're okay. trying to talk about. Great. Oh, well, I'm excited. If you like, if you enjoyed the video, please give us a like and share and subscribe to the channel. And you can contact Dr. Holacek at mholacek at hotmail.com. And also his Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, bring him home to Monticello, Citizens which, for which Change.